Okay, it's an overloaded program. We'll have to start anyway, even if people are joining us uh, while talking. Um, very welcome. My name is Dag Bautzen. Um, I'm going to talk about this amongst some other things. But I'll first try to give a little introduction. This is an EAAE conference. EAAE is about architectural education. And then there is architecture, told by architects, like we have seen in the keynote speakers and presentations. So in a way, there are kind of two worlds. And we are trying to link them all the time, at least on an intellectual level. But the jump from education into architectural practice is gigantic. Carmen Pinoch said on numerous projects this morning, I said no. For most starting young professionals, somebody else says no. No because of coming from the wrong country. No because of different regulations in the different member states. No because of missing competences. No because of impossible social statutes. No, because of gender-related issues. No, because of impossible salaries. No, because of time-consuming conditions when working as an architect. No, because of the killing world of competitions. No, because of objections towards proposed projects by formal or informal groups of people all the time and more and more. No, because of disrespect towards the labor produced by architects. No, because of the wrongly understood perception of architecture being something artistic. Ruth Sagemann, here, president of the ACE, was explaining during the lunch about her son not feeling borders in Europe when visiting other countries when working or studying abroad. Young people take Lime, Bolt, Bird, Dot or Uber scooters everywhere in Europe. Internationalization has, has come to a point that the, world, that the word itself has become unnecessary. European institutes and bodies know that, but a lot of member states don't. As an introduction to the round table, where all important transnational organizations around architects and architecture are represented here right now today, I want to present to you some concerns, some difficulties, some new or reaffirmed insights through the Architectures Afterlife project, in the hope that we all end together can contribute to some necessary renewed attention to these problems, to possible changes, to necessary ameliorations. Because the new European Bauhaus component inclusivity is not okay for young architectural graduates. And as such, the conditions of working context are not sustainable, neither beautiful. So what I want to do is to give some items here to trigger the debate later on in the round table and quickly talk about some aspects, information and stuff like that. Now I copied from the A survey every two years, really interesting survey. I copied some slides, sorry for that, but they are amazing still. And, uh, on the left, you see the number of architects in Europe, and you see that two-thirds of the architects come from five countries, which means what is going on, um, which means are there too many or are there not enough, which means we are all different member states. And you see on the graphic on the left that the differences are really gigantic, Italy on number one. But look at the differences. And then some small countries, like my country, Belgium, has an enormous amount of architects in relation 
to uh, the uh, population. This is also a very nice graphic because actually it proves that architects under age of 40 are a majority in most countries. It means we are not only talking about education and students, we are talking about the same young people uh, when we look at architecture. And on the left bottom you see that average 22% of architecture graduates studied in another country. That figure is rising all the time. I'll come back to that. So, talking about an interconnected Europe, there are some particularities that are really important to know or to realize. That is that some regions in Europe are really attractive to students coming from abroad. Some regions are democratic in their education, others not. Some are expensive, others not. But the attractiveness is also related to architectural quality. And some regions in uh, Europe have this tendency to have a, a higher quality all over, all the time. Which means that Europe attracts all the time students from other countries, not only European, but more and more non-European students. And it is a phenomenon in a lot of our schools, in Scandinavia, in England, in Belgium. We are talking about rising numbers, uh, going, doubling, tripling, uh, like every year. Now, attracting all these students is one nice thing, but then when they want to go into practice, when they want to stay a couple of years in the country they have been studying in, uh, to get some more uh, uh, practice uh, experience, to do an internship because the country is asking it, they are most of the time confronted with this member state Europe, which is not European thinking, but which is about all the, the kind of differences. For instance, um, in only Flanders, since 2018, and now today it's uh, larger, 130 uh, files from third country nationalities. I mean, I'm talking about Iranis, Pakistanis, Bangladesh students who want to stay a little bit and work. They are hit with impossible uh, rules uh, that they have to solve during their student time before actually starting a practice. That is not only the case in Belgium, it's in a lot of countries. Um, yesterday I heard that the French part, uh, French speaking part of the uh, Chamber of Architects in Belgium is suing France because France is not accepting the degrees of Belgium. And you have, you have to know that in the French speaking part of Belgium, 60% uh, of the students come actually from France. So you don't, know, don't want to know these differences in uh, um, uh, practice regulations on internship obliged, not different system in all the world, what kind of a impossible trajectory young students have to go through. And the schools are asked to help them, but the schools don't know how to help them because the regulations are really complicated. Now, architecture as a mindset is a title that we use from this group sitting over there and so more uh, of a nice bunch of, that's thanks to EAE, people that found themselves uh, together to write an Erasmus Plus project called Architecture's Afterlife. We're talking about Torino, Zagreb, Valencia, uh, KU Leuven, Antwerp, uh, RCA, um, I forgot one, no, okay. Um, and um, actually, uh, this is an Erasmus Plus project that is really interesting. I will give you some insights. But as a matter of fact, we were going to have, you know, Erasmus Plus projects or uh, uh, have to have multiplier events. And we agreed amongst ourselves and with uh, officials that this meeting is also a multiplier event. For that, I'm asking you, when there's a paper coming uh, through your seat, please sign it and put your name so that the multiplier event is uh, nicely... Uh, all organized. This is uh, the nice logo of this uh, project, uh, and I still think the, the title Architecture's Afterlife is a really nice one. Um, it's ending the end of this year, and uh, some facts and figures here. We have uh, 
had uh, a survey that is by uh, uh, now more than 2,600 respondents have been filling it in from a lot of countries, as you see. Average age 38, which corresponds with the A slide. Um, would you choose the education again? Majority says yes. Um, nevertheless, 22% of the respondents completed studies after studying architecture, and this is kind of overview of what kind of studies they uh, did besides architecture. Only 9% reported that they initiated another study due to a lack of acquired knowledge skills in their previous study. That is remarkable. That is an, a very important point in this architecture's afterlife uh, project. And uh, it's due to following uh, slides. Now, in order to categorize uh, people who we have been asking to fill in the survey, people with an architectural diploma, uh, we have uh, uh, organized it in four flows, uh, namely people, first flow, that really are kind of classic architect, making projects, people that um, are combining architecture practice with another field, people that work outside, uh, the classic architectural discipline and people are in, in a related sector and then uh, last one uh, some people unrelated sector uh, figures. So now you see the proportions here uh, and that is an amazing uh, scheme because the classic architects, the black box on the right, you can see that is about 60% which means 40% of the people with an architectural degree Partly or totally are working outside the classic thing we call architectural practice. Of course, in the different countries, it's different. I take the middle uh, circle in Belgium because of the huge amount of architects, because of the attractive region being very uh, high evolved in cultural sector festivals, you know, we are a festival country, yeah? uh, tomorrow and whatever. Um, you can see that uh, on the left, there is really huge part of this flow that uh, is working in a related sector. Uh, other countries, Croatia needs more real architects one way or another. So there is a lot of differences. Now, the afterlife study is about skills and competences. And here you see an overview of the types of skills and, and competences that we have been putting in questions into the uh, survey. There are the classic skills and competences like uh, uh, on, 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 on the top to become an architect, you all know. There is skills related to processing information. Um, there are in the middle personal competence skills, important ones, determination, work ethic, endurance, handling criticism, flexibility, constant learning and self-improvement, dealing with uncertainty. There is some on diversity competence, also very imp important, empathy, openness. We've been talking it all day already in the framework of the new European Baumhaus. And then there are some skills on employability. Now, we have been asking which skills have you, been have you have acquired during your education and which one are you using? And then you see that all architects, all architect graduates use digital skills, spatial skills, design thinking, technical knowledge, etc. in a kind of similar way to the way it was acquired uh, during the education. Processing uh, information, dealing with complexity, um, decision making, being critical, all these out of the box creative competences that architects have are really used the most on the right side. Personal competences, and that is a really important point, work ethic, flexibility, determination, constant learning, we've heard that yesterday morning, endurance, dealing with uncertainty and handling criticism are really used a lot by all graduate architects. And then there is um, these ones on collaboration, teamwork, working with clients, openness to things, 
that are also used very well, and some of them are not very well acquired. As you see, that's a classic one, working with clients on the left bottom, business management, of course, we all lack a little bit of that. But here you see how well the skills are acquired with endurance on number one. How well did you acquire these personal competences, these skills and knowledge? And I will have in the next slide some matches and mismatches. And there you see that actually these personal competences, which are so important, which we don't talk about enough, are really corresponding, the, the mismatch is not big, eh? on the, the red you can see it. The only mismatch is cooperation competence, employability and a little bit diversity competences. But at the same time it shows uh, on the bottom of the slide that these personal competences are really the ones that all graduate architects use the, more, uh, the most. And it doesn't matter which flow they are in. On the right top, the real architects, the classic architects, as we call them, you see the purple box with the personnel competences really being big, the biggest. And it's the same for the partly or totally uh, outside uh, classic architects in a in a, uh, or in the related or really outside. So you see that no matter what kind of job these people are doing, that these personnel uh, um, competences are really important. Um, this is a very serious thing to know. I mean, when we talk about it, people tend to say, yes, we know that. It's of course, of course, it's always about endurance. Yes, it's a hard study. But these, this study really proves with facts and figures that it is like that, first of all, for the whole discipline, and secondly, that it is uh, important in all these flows, no matter whether students become real uh, classic architects or not. Now, knowing that, there is maybe something wrong with Bologna, Europe, in terms of these nine points of the European directives. There is different types of problematics related to, to that, but when you read, you know, all of them, uh, the, the nine uh, points here, uh, from A to K, that is that it looks like, okay, these European directives talk only about classic architecture and not about all the other things. Secondly, it never talks about the personnel competences we have been seeing. Thirdly, it actually is a kind of way to talk about architecture as a professional matter and not as a university discipline. It's only about professional competences here. So in our view, there is something wrong with this classic approach that we all have to follow in our curricula in all schools and universities throughout Europe. But at the same time, it is a passport and there are not a lot of disciplines in Europe having this kind of regulation system. So to destroy it or to rewrite it would be a bit more problematic than I first thought. It is really a passport enabling us to be international architects and to go wherever we want if we can pass through all these Kafkaian uh, difficulties. If you read them carefully, there is only two of the directives, namely E and F, that start with the nice word understanding. The first one is understanding of the relationship between people and buildings, and etc. And F is about understanding the profession of architecture and the role of architects in society. Now, understanding means that we can have a lot of interpretations on that word and that we could and should go much deeper in understanding what these understandings could be meaning. And in that sense, I think it's a really nice way to in the future tackle uh, and to discuss it in the open uh, uh, panel discussion later on, how we can include this topic 
into a kind of conference topics, etc. Because deepening these E and F allows us to match more the competence business I was talking about and the mismatches and the matches, to talk about more what is now Bologna in terms of architecture becoming a discipline from a university rather than just a professional education. It is important in relation to research and as such to the research academy of the EAAE and it has all these possibilities not to destroy the directives as such but to open debates and to enforce important talks on what E and F really could mean in the future. Talking about inclusivity, I showed you that 40% of the architect graduates are not classic architects. It means that at the bottom, curricula, conferences, research bodies, competent authorities need to focus on this group much more. Otherwise, we are losing them all. They are not member of whatever boards or whatever. So there is this need, and Hannah will talk about it tomorrow, uh, together with Michaela in a panel uh, presentation, uh, the last point here. We think there is a need for a kind of concept or idea of a chamber for deviated architects. Because if we keep on dreaming that architectural education leads to architects as such and only, then there is something completely wrong. We, these people that are working for Tomorrowland, for graphic, for creative sectors, you name it, all these people feel, feel lost. Although, and the mindset proves it, and the architectural afterlife project proves it, they still feel act and think as an architect. And that is so important because the skills they learned in our curricula are so wide. But they cannot express themselves officially as an architect. They call themselves an architect, still when they are not doing the classic architecture, but they cannot be represented. There are no conferences on their kind of stuff. You know, that's why this point is there. Um, so, Important also, and that's the last point I want to talk about in this thing, is that yesterday we heard about you have to learn all your life to become wise. That was how it was pronounced. This lifelong learning is an issue in a lot of countries. Uh, architecture uh, practice tends to escape sometimes in some countries to this European agreement that it belongs to a discipline that constantly needs to ameliorate, to improve, and to learn what is new. The problem is that we have this educational system, three plus two bachelor and master. In a lot of countries, then there is two years of internship, and then there is the practice. And in the three areas, this kind of learning on other kind of skills is organized in a totally different way. So what we propose also is that together we think a bit more on a global structure to have this round uh, red uh, circle or rectangular where the red little bullets are about lifelong long learning components throughout the two years of master, throughout the internship, and throughout the practice, and that it is an envelope of a kind of passport portfolio that you can make when being a student, during the internship, and then afterwards, so that there is no separation anymore, which allows much more interaction between education and practice, between schools and chambers of architects. That is a kind of uh, uh, message in this um, uh, PowerPoint. I hope I gave enough kind of stuff to think about and I repeat, Oya will present who is here. I repeat that there are a lot of people here from all the important bodies in architecture for the first time in an EAE conference. We had a nice meeting in Paris 
talking about some of this stuff uh, uh, three months ago. Uh, Oya was there, I was there, and a lot of people uh, from the panel were there. But this is a kind of first continuation of that discussion, and next year, I think, I hope, I, we promise, we continue on some of these subjects. I think it is really time to tackle some of these really nasty problems related to architecture and to not always organize conference about beautiful presentations and beautiful architecture. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, I think we continue. I would like to invite the panel. Uh, I will do it uh, by calling your names so that people know to which organization uh, you belong. Um, I'd first like to call Sharon Har. She is the president of the ACSA, a long uh, traditional relationship between EAAE and ACSA, our sister organization in the United States. Association of College Schools of Architecture, Sharon, great to have you here, please, Thank you. please take a seat. Then we have Ruth Schagerman. Ruth is the uh, president of the European Council of Architects. She is also an architect. Great to have you here, yes, Ruth. Thank you. Wonderful. Then we have Anna Ramos. Anna Ramos is also an architect, and those of you uh, who know Ms. van der Rohe Foundation, she is the director. And we work also with uh, Anna since not too long, but for a long time in different ways, especially now with the Young Talent Award, EAAE. Ms. van der Rohe Foundation and also ACE is speaking out in every three years. Also um, supported by European Union. Then we have Manuel Blanco. Where is Manuel? Yes. <laughs> Our esteemed host and dean of ETSAM. We have Dubrovko Bacic. I, I have, I have. I didn't forget about you, Olga, no worries. <laughs> so, Dubrovko is also from ACE, and he's uh, <coughs> one of the responsibles for the education chapter in ACE. We have Michael Monti. Michael, he is also from ACSA. He is the permanence, can I say it that way? Michael, long standing, <laughs> long standing <laughs> permanence um, in ACSA. We all know presidents, deans, they come and go, but there are some very important people. They look that the organizations function and survive. Then we have Thomas Fonje. He's also an architect, former president of UIA. Great pleasure to have you here, Thomas. And now we have Olga. Olga, mm -hmm. I have to quickly make sure that I don't speak your surname wrong. Olga Mihalikova, she is from Eneka. Eneka is the organization we just got to know, thanks to ACE. Uh, but Doug has already been doing a lot with them. It's about the admission of the architects to the profession on the questions. Doug, you are going to be the moderator of this session. We have explicitly said uh, we will focus on the points that Doug has uh, given as introduction. Afterlife has been a very important project, like Wicked questions. I think Ivan is here. Wicked uh, questions was also such an Erasmus project with huge impact. And these two projects will, among others, help us to build further projects uh, from EAAE in collaboration with you all. So great that you're here. Doug, shall I ask a first question? Am I allowed? Although you're the moderator, I can't keep it back. <laughs> e and F, let's start with talking about that. 
What are your opinions on that? If you allow me, I will make my statement, which may be a political statement. Ah, political in the sense that it's not maybe the correct thing to say as EAAE president, but as dean, I know that uh, formulating things openly, if they are written, has its advantages. They're open to interpretation. It's the people who make use of these rules. It's not how it is written. So if we look at the E and F, uh, what do we do with them? Shall we, shall we stick to its openness? And if it's the Venice, the other side of the coin, shall we say we have to be more precise about it? And Doug made a very good point of being careful about touching such an important body of uh, regulations that allow us also quite a lot of things. Who is going to answer the first question? Okay, I will this, and, and if anybody in the public puts up his hand or her hand, no problem. This is, should be a really open discussion. Oh. Oh, yeah, that so we have them. Sure. Yeah. If, if you need. Really. No, but no, just but for everyone. Pocket Bible. Pocket Bible. Yes, maybe I will, I will just um, start. And um, Oya, you mentioned quite correctly um, about, let's say, how careful we have to deal with legislation um, in Europe because, yes, obviously we are 28, now 27 um, member states and um, the profession is quite diverse. And um, not only the profession, also the education no? in, in the background. And um, let's say the route um, where, where, it, where um, yes, our capacities come from. And in this, in this light, I really have to say, um, I'm more the one for an open and interpretation way because the closer you regulate or you describe, the more narrow the path gets how to fit everyone in. So um, the diversity, which is a very big, um, uh, let's say, value that we have um, in Europe, must remain, in my opinion. And um, we should open the doors that these, this diversity has really um, a successful future. And so I would say keep it open and we can discuss what can be behind it. But um, I remember just the, the, the last uh, uh, modernization of this directive and it was huge. So we really have to be careful what we ask for at this point. That's maybe for the beginning. Um, two eight people in a row. Um, I know, uh, Doug, that this Article 46 gives you a hard time, but I would just like to point out that it was uh, the, the version you have it on the screen is, is a uh, older one, so it was modernized a little bit. <laughs> and you have four points actually mentioning understanding. Um, no one is happy with this, but for the time being, this is, I would say, the best we, we have. And I would still argue that it is, it's a minimum requirement. So it, it, it does not forbid schools to add more content on each of the points, right? And also, um, I, I, you know, it, it's like with any regulation. If you want it to be more precise and more detailed, then it's less flex flexible in a way. I, I would see that almost anything can go within this. And of course, the issue is how happy we are with the formulations, not very. And if you compare different translations, the, the situation is even worse, how they translated this in other languages. It's <laughs> and then there is also another remedy, which is perhaps less um, prescriptive, which, which is um, I was discussing this with Thomas earlier, so UIA, UNESCO Charter on Education, which is far more ex um, extensive, but it was done by architects 10 years, Anna's 
father actually was head of the group who did this in 1997, then it was revised several times, so this is also something, it's okay, it's outside of the, let's say, EU regulation, but it's something that the profession, international profession, it has a weight, UIA, UNESCO, and then Europe as well, can adhere to and, and accept, and it has much more points, and it's much more, prof let's say, to our made to our measure obviously made by the architects. We don't know who actually phrased these 11 points. Yeah, just before somebody else takes the word, the thing is, the thing is that there is so many organizations out there, professional organizations, architecture, chambers of architecture, criticizing schools because they deliver students that after five years of study know nothing. And the gap between this university world, discipline, scientific world, academic world, and the professional world is something very difficult for all responsible people in education to take into account. So having some more precise formulations, not to narrow down root, not to uh, restrict, uh, and I repeat, G and, F, uh, G and H is also understanding, but there are really classic ways of uh, talking about uh, how do you make a brief and how do you uh, calculate a beam. But E and F would be helpful if there is some more context that we all agree on as a kind of argumentation to the world of complainers of uh, towards education, delivering students knowing nothing. Uh, and I was talking maybe, Anna, you can take the word. Uh, Olga, sorry. Um, we were talking at lunchtime about what is qualifications. And there were so many types also of, of uh, curricula in Europe. And we, you said a nice thing. Then we come back uh, to uh, Olga. I'm sorry. <laughs> so thank you very much, Doug. Yes, we have talked about the fact that normally the life is always ahead of uh, the regulation. So although, yes, we have just started cooperation with EAAE, I am really grateful for being here. It's representing the not always beloved competent authorities. But on the other hand, I have been for many years also involved in um, uh, Architects Council of Europe. And we have been uh, many times discussing inside ACE the revision of Article 46. Also at the last revision of the directive in 2015, it was a big topic. The reason why it, ha it could never change, it, because there was a real difficulty to get like consensus on. Um, someone wants to change E and F and someone wants to change others and I, I fully understand what you say, it is behind the reality, that's true, <laughs> I mean no one is questioning it, it's old one and it's based on uh, the directive that was in 1985, so basically that's where it comes from. Uh, but concerning what you mentioned is yes, we mentioned today as a point I I don't know what <laughs> we really want to discuss in depth, and it's mixed qualification is the case, what you mentioned about Belgian and French uh, orders, and um, so the, the Valois order of, uh, uh, or French speaking part of uh, Belgium and French order, and the issue with uh, studying somewhere, but not being really qualified in another country, which means, yes, it's uh, young people, after Bologna, and we have it proves it's proved also by sector study. They are really mobile, so they have bachelor in one country, masters in another country, practical experience in completely different country. Then they move to another country, and obviously the directive did not foresee it this way. And this is what we call mixed qualification. <laughs> That's which the word. Is, which is a really nice concept, mixed qualifications, <laughs> because it also tackles other types of education, like the Dutch academies, where you have forms of dual learning, 
and in other countries there is existing private schools. So mixed qualifications is a really in interesting uh, and, uh, concept. And just, just to finish it, not to go too much into detail, not to lose the track of what we have been discussing. It's, yes, we are trying to, as competent authorities, normally there's a big voluntary convergence, meaning most of the competent authorities seek right away how to recognize than not to recognize. But just the last point, the directive is regulating all the professions in the automatic recognition, which guarantees the free movement. There are just health professions. Architects, they are the only one that is not health profession and, um, or not health related directly, <laughs> let's say. And um, it's the only profession that has not prescribed curriculum, that it was the first one that was uh, regulated by learning outcomes or based on learning outcomes that are those famous 11 points. So that would be all from me. Thank Thanks, you. Olga. Anna wants to say something. Yeah, just um, Fundación Mies van der Rohe, we organized jointly with ACE and with EAAE and with the support of the European Commission, the Young Talent Architecture Award. It was created uh, aiming to uh, support the talent of recently graduated architects, urban planners, and landscapers. We have this open scopus. Uh, who will be responsible for transforming our environment in the near future? It emerged from an interest in the initial stages of these architects' development and the desire to support their talent as they enter into the professional world. And we do that through their diploma projects. Uh, we see projects from all the EU countries plus all the countries uh, which are in European territory, even if they are not EU. And we do also invite schools from outside of Europe. Uh, in one edition, we invited Asian schools. In the last edition, we invited Latin American schools. We, are, we still need to fix this, but we are planning to invite African schools for the next edition. So complexity and diversity is there. Every country, every national uh, uh, regulation is different, but with, I tell you, we see our juries see something which is always there in common. Um, and what we see, and I'm going to connect with something you mentioned, which are some region of interest. I'm telling you because we don't only organize the Young Talent Architecture Award, but also the European Union Prize for Contemporary Architecture, the Mies van der Rohe Award, like the, the Mies Award. And we see that the attractiveness of architecture moves throughout Europe. We sometimes we see some countries emerging and then after two editions there's a big spot on another area. And I would say that happens more when the are suddenly there's a magic thing that architects in that area are able to connect with social interests in that area. And luckily, the standards or the regulations of that country at the same time are kind of helping. So you, you have this positive spiral. But that kind of changes, because changes in society are very rapid, actually. And this to say that I support a very open, I mean, I'm very happy to see this text here. It's not easy to understand the relationship between people and buildings. It's only that, it's very ambitious, and all the things. So if you take it in the broader sense, it's a super ambitious sentence, actually. You know? and, and I would in, uh, make the red line lower and include preparing briefs that take account of social factors. If, if for instance, what's happening now here in Spain, a lot of um, uh, social housing, which is not the standard social housing produced by the government, but self-organized. Yeah? So these changes are very rapid, and it's very difficult to write down sentences that are able to support 10 years changes. So I would go to an open and inclusive and generous, let's say, interpretation. Thanks very much, because you made a nice point on the influence of qualitative and socially in, uh, inspired architecture to ways of thinking and countries and governments and regulations, yeah, which is a really nice one. Uh, Manuel, before you, uh, no, wait, uh, Sharon first and then Manuel. Work. 
to wait. Oh, okay, okay. No, no. then Manuel. We can finish some Europe, European no, conversation no, no, no. and jump I, across, I prefer, I prefer across the US future. Okay. Um, obviously, uh, in the United States, actually North America, because we include the Canadian schools as well, um, we don't operate under Article 46, we, but we have a whole host of other things we operate uh, within. And there's really, in terms of the accreditation of schools, there are really three prongs. There are three organizations or three pieces responsible for that. There's the schools, the profession, which is the American Institute of Architects, and um, NCARB, the National Council of Architectural Registration Boards. And ultimately, they are the people who determine the length of internship and write the exams that we take in order to become and license and then have the rules around um, continuing education. Um, and that suggests that the three are actually equal. Uh, but in fact, one of the things that I was very struck by, Doug, in your presentation was this notion of not this sort of triumvirate of thought, but rather the idea that the schools are there to provide graduates to go into the profession. And we know that in the US, we have, we have not conducted such an in-depth, incredible study, but we also know that only a small, uh, not a small, but a, only a certain number of our graduates ultimately become licensed architects. And the result of that is that we are deemed actually inadequate. Uh, what's wrong when schools are producing people who don't ultimately become licensing, licensed architects, when in fact, many of those individuals uh, produce very positive impact on the built environment. So I really applaud the study. Um, but what we have in terms of the structure in the US, in terms of what the schools are now expected to do under our current accreditation requirements is exactly very different here. We are required to do G, H, I, J, and K, and they are all ability, which is those are the demonstrations. Those are shown through projects. Everything else now is um, understand or be exposed to. And we have much more flexibility in terms of that. We actually now assess ourselves in terms of how well we do these things. The consequence, um, so we're happy as schools because we're not being asked to fulfill 54 separate requirements like we once were. We only have a couple. But those couple are everything. Um, and so the consequence of that is that these core competencies, which don't include, by the way, the relationship between people and buildings, society, climate change, uh, gender equity, social justice, any of those things are, no long, are not in our requirements and, so, and are therefore not deemed important and they're not actually even um, part of what you need to fulfill in your internship before you can sit for the licensing exam. So I'm going to argue in favor of CF and the expansion, but with a liberal understanding in which the schools can explain for themselves how they're carrying that out. And that the core competencies are just the core of a much larger idea of what the discipline delivers, because we hear exactly what you hear, which is that the offices say, the students aren't you know, ready. And in fact, we're, we're fulfilling all these things, but to be a competent architect or a competent contributor to the built environment in some way or another, it's all the other things. Um, not The building, yes, the building has to stand up, but we know how to teach that. And we know how to test for it. We don't know how to test for empathy, for understanding, for cultural difference, for those kinds of things. And um, that's what I really appreciated in the report that you've done or the study you've done is that those things are being asked about, which they're not being asked about in our country, even though that's what we're actually working on in schools. So. Uh, thanks a lot for this nice comment. By the way, Michaela, when will we be able to get out with our production and investigations and book? somewhere in the beginning of 2023. Probably, 99% sure there will be a book, a Rutledge book. Um, Manuel. Sorry if I am going to be a little bit disruptive because uh, thank you for inviting me. Maybe uh, Ivan was better sitting here 
because he's more appropriate in the mainstream discourse than me. I love it a lot, your presentation, even if I don't agree, because for me, all the blocks you were making were architecture, because architecture is not only the new building practice, all the related practice that you were saying to architecture, for me, are architecture as well. If we in the art world saying that art is what an artist say that is art, architecture is what an architect says architecture, or the people recognize like architecture. And I am an architect that is a curator, that is a museographer, so I work in things and in places where I think I am an architect, even if my colleagues that have done in a small house for his uh, mother, and we, we cannot blame the mother houses, Venturi proved it, uh, tells me it's a pity that you don't do architecture. But uh, I have been doing trillions of euros in projects all my life of things like this up here. But there is a study, and it's yours, and it's your thing, it's afterlife, and that's uh, very, very important. When I see these kind of things, I am always very, very nervous, <laughs> because I, 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 I hate bureaucratese, I hate academicese, I hate the language that we use to try to define things that we know what they are, and they are so difficult to put in, 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 in words, to define, to explain. Uh, but I love that it's done, and I love that we are dealing with it, and I know that our schools has been evaluating using uh, this. But I was asking myself two things. That's the reason I was asking, sorry for being disruptive. It's us we have to be defining with society what architects do, or are we already in a moment that when we try that society learned what architecture is? Because in the general education of the people around us, they uh, study the most complicated programs, but the things that all of them need to use, and it's not a washing machine, is the architecture, nobody teach the people how to use architecture, what architecture is, and what they can demand. So we are being asked to define, to understand the relationship of the people with buildings. But we are talking about people that never has been taught to study their relationship with buildings. So maybe it's the time that from our side, from the professional side, we start pushing authorities that architecture has to be taught in the school. And not like a list of buildings and who made it, who cares? Well, I care because I'm a freak, but who cares? But things that have to be seen and done. I was trying to figure it out. Uh, I received publicity of, uh, I don't know what program, I am in a waiting list of I don't know what, that is transforming text in pictures. So there is a new program that is going to transform text in pictures. I would like putting all that list in that program and seeing if it's architecture, the outcome from that program. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Manuel. Actually, your criticism is corresponding very much to what we were talking about. Two little things I want to add to that. Don't forget, we all know it, but don't forget that architecture studies is a dream study for most people in Europe. Like 90% of 18-year-old people think, oh, architecture, I'm going to study that, not knowing anything about what it's about. Secondly, it's one of the hardest studies in terms of working hours from day one till the end of the uh, fifth year, they are working harder than any other student of other faculties' disciplines. And that makes a difference in which I still think with Afterlife that we are proving that talking about it and using other words, even if they are said, that it is necessary. Dubravko. Thanks. I, I want you just briefly to comment on your anxiety about everyone picking on schools about not producing the... I, I, I teach as well. I mean, we have people in here... On, on, let's talk, say on talk in the mic. Talk oh, sorry, on behalf, of, on behalf of the profession, let's say, here. Um, 
a as ACE, at least as European Association, we never meddle in the curricula, obviously, or the, the, the so this is the academic freedom, right? We cannot, we cannot necessarily guarantee for our member organizations at lower level, you know, we, if it's some requirements for, for the, or, um, I don't know, uh, questions towards the school about the curricula and so on. But, I mean, I, I, I don't feel this pressure. I mean, it's not the obligation of the school to deliver day one perfect professional. I mean, all those office partners also graduated 12, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, and they knew shit the moment they graduated. So there, not everything can be learned at school. There is a process which is dealt differently in different countries. In, I remember when Carlotto from Norway told me, you know, like I was asking about the details in, in, in Norway. He said, the architect in Norway is who we decide is architect, basically who graduates from the school. And, and then there are other countries where you have to work two years and maybe take a professional exam and so on. So there is this period of learning other things and, and it's not necessarily the mission of the schools to produce cat monkeys from, the, from day one or, or someone who will know all the details and everything there is. No, there is other things to be considered and, and other kind of hum, hu, humanistic um, uh, aspect of the discipline to be and experimental and also to be um, uh, dealt with within the school. So I, I just I ignore them in a way. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Um, yes, I wanted to um, pick up something very important Manuel, uh, Manuel has been uh, mentioning. Um, the relationship with people. No? And um, I think we are in Europe at a very pivotal moment. Because um, if we, we heard about the discussion on the new European Bauhaus and the idea of the new European Bauhaus, because um, I, I remember when Ursula von der Leyen two w years ago came up with this idea, we said, what's new European Bauhaus? We learn at university about Bauhaus, yes, there is uh, knowledge about that, and suddenly something new appears, what is that? But she's very tricky because with this, let's say, name, new European Bauhaus, we suddenly start discussing in, on European level, in, on policy level, um, what is the quality of the built environment and the quality of architecture. And really implementing that architecture is a common good and the question is, it has to go broader because we are discussing amongst us already 100 years about the beauty, the aesthetics, um, the quality of architecture, but the problem is the people. And people is not only the citizens of Europe, it's administration, it's um, young, young people in the schools. And with Mia, we have been discussing last year um, in preparation of the conference, uh, what is about the education in the schools. You mentioned it, um, Manuel. And this is the big challenge, how to be get the quality of architecture in a broader sense. How does Miss Müller, this is the typical name in Germany, um, understand that she wants quality? And what is quality? And then we are discussing about economic, we are uh, discussing about ecological, social, and especially about cultural aspects. And maybe we find them in these 11 points, but I think we have to understand that we now have to get into action. And uh, we saw today from, from, um, from Carmen, wonderful best practice of architecture. She is connecting with the surrounding. It's about connecting the different, um, the different disciplines. It's about designers, it's about artists, it's about landscape um, urban planners, and it's about our responsibility for the future. And you are educating the young people which will take the challenge of the future. And if we say we want to be climate neutral until 2050, um, I don't know how it's in the United States, but we are under pressure. And we are under pressure to uh, develop our built environment in high quality on all levels. And basically, that's the moment where I'm really getting worried because we will have money, we are under pressure of time, and everything has to be quick. Who is going to do the whole work? 
when is everyone going to do this work? And I think that is really uh, important. It's really about the role. Which role are we playing? What is quality of architecture? What are our competences? And what is our responsibility for the future? I think that is uh, at the heart of, of our actions. No discussions, actions. The future is already now. Yes. Actually, we are in yesterday. Yes. So actions, definitely. But what we need to know, in my opinion, is that we are not the only one. Yes. The self-centric thinking of the architect has to, at one point, stop. Yeah. It should have stopped some time ago, no? Yeah. It's shared responsibility. Yeah. Tomorrow afternoon in the General Assembly, uh, yeah, uh, in the General Me oh, assembly. assembly, we are talking about future activities. So Ruth, remind us that in some of these, well, or in a lot, we take uh, into account what you were saying. Um, Thomas, uh, uh, from the point of view, from your point of view, or the International Union of Architects, you think that there are major uh, important things happening on technological improvements, on um, uh, machine learning, on extreme digitalization. How do you look at these points in relation to what we have been saying here about empathy and social skills? Now, the first thing I was going to say is when you had F and G up on the board, the, my experience is there are two things people don't like. One is the way things are and the other is anyone who tries to change them. <laughs> and I think our profession is a pretty responsive operation. Um, schools respond to demand of students. Architects respond to the demands of clients. Faculty members respond to the demands of the profession and the students. And if you don't respond, you don't really survive. It's, it's kind of a market-driven enterprise, I think. Um, I've been in Europe since 1989, so that's a stretch by any standard. And the only time I hear about Article 46 is when someone from ACE is in the room. That's the only time I ever hear about it. I don't know how profound its influence is. I don't know how much it really shapes architectural education and the profession. But my guess is not so much. Um, that's my guess. And I would like to associate myself with uh, remarks about um, trying to uh, show the public how better design makes life better. And um, for many architects, I think we've been handmaidens of the wrong kind of development. We've gone along with wrong patterns of development. We've served clients who are not acting in the best interests of society. And, and I think that's a very difficult kind of thing to change. I was very encouraged by one of the faculty presentations about uh, spatial garbage uh, today from Flanders. A very interesting exercise to have students look at underutilized, degraded, uh, improperly used pieces of land uh, and to try and understand how those elements in the landscape can be transformed for public benefit. And I think the more our profession and the schools focus on these issues that speak to the quality of life, the better off we will all be. And not worried so much about paragraph F and G and article 46 of section 8 in a document from 1985 that uh, has, frankly, pretty limited influence and even less appeal. So. Um, I guess that's my remark. Uh, th thanks a lot. Uh, don't forget, uh, Olga knows there are some schools <laughs> like ours working for years on these bloody directives because our degrees are some by some member states not accepted anymore and it is because of Bologna. Everything changed so, I mean, it is kind of important. Uh, Michael, do you want to say add, uh, something? Sure. And um, then I can be brief. Um, I, I want to tag on to something Sharon said earlier about um, the trajectories of graduates in, in architecture. It was th four years ago, um, 
the American Institute of Architects San Francisco chapter did a, a massive study and our ACSA's research director did the, the analysis for them. It was looking at career trajectories of architects, or sorry, of architecture school graduates, regardless of where they went, and the number that st stuck out to me was more than 80% of graduates saw themselves as having a positive impact on the built environment. So the influence of school on them, regardless of what ca career trajectory they took, it was about what they can do to impact the built environment. And I think, you know, over the last 10 years that the, the I, I've been with ACSA 18 years, but, but over the last 10 years, the things that have been most uh, um, important to me are the, are the ethical foundations of the profession. Because the things that architects, as I initially learned it, were licensed to do are to prevent buildings from falling down. But technology is taking over that role. They don't need, our, like, tech, technology can disrupt all the things that architects could do, and to me what's left is the relationship of people to buildings. It's, it's the roles of empathy. So the things that, that our graduates ought to know that others don't know and that we should be licensed for isn't for our ability to use BIM anymore, it's for our ability to work with communities and seek um, uh, positive ends for those. And that's a very complicated discussion because architects are beholden to capital, to clients, to things like that. And the ways, in, especially in the United States, where you have to rely on for-profit companies to allow you to become licensed because if you don't get all the areas of internship, then you're not gonna ever get licensed. But a for-profit corporation doesn't necessarily have the best interests of their employees at heart. So there are these internal kind of uh, conflicts that, that I think the only way to, to try to solve them is to go back to the foundation, which is the ethical basis of the profession, which is to improve the quality of, of, of the built environment. That's the knowledge that we ought to have. So the last thing I'll say is the this is probably not reflected so much in, in the European context, but in, in the United States, the cost of, of, of higher education is in, in, incredible. It, 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 it's grown um, far more uh, quickly than inflation over the last three or four decades. Um, so we've been getting a lot of pressure to shorten the amount of time to be in architecture school because students are graduating with loads and loads of debt. The problem with that is it raises the question of what do you learn in architecture school that you don't learn when you're on the job? Architecture firms are not cut out to, to, to teach people about the relationship between people and buildings because you don't just learn that by watching people interact with buildings or by building them. You read literature, you take social science courses, you have um, a broad education to understand the human condition and human behavior. And, and that's the kind of thing that you don't learn in, um, in firms. And so we want students to learn so much about climate at change, about uh, building performance, in addition to codes and uh, management and all those things. And I think what's important is in school you learn the ethical foundations, the ways in which people relate to building, er, to, to, the ways the, the built environment affects people and vice versa. Thanks, Thomas Ruth. You want to add something? Yes, maybe. Um, I, I just want to say that um, we have a very interesting concept here in Europe that we say we have um, the academic study and we have the practical experience. And practical experience is something that you do on the job, yes, because it's about build, um, writing a building permit, preparing building permit, doing calculations on, um, on, on the object and, and these things. And then at the academic level, it's really about um, you just said it, um, Michael. It's really about learning things that you will not have time to yeah. do it during your daily um, job, let's say so. No, And um, I think this ability is the beauty of our um, education. And um, yesterday, Manuel, we were speaking about the quality. And I think you also put it on our list, quantity, quality. 
And um, I think it's so utmost important to maintain a quality in education because we are going now really through a crisis in Europe. We are speaking about a devastating war. We have, um, we have this pressure of um, the climate crisis. We um, uh, survived somehow Corona. And we are in the midst of an energy standoff. So the pressure is really, really high at the moment, and we need a strong profession. And what is a strong profession? Highly educated academically, highly prepared in um, their studios to really challenge these, um, uh, these, these, these elements that are uh, pressed upon us if we want to live in a, in a nature, in um, a cooperation with our nature and, and feel well. So um, I think that's really, really important. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, any question or remark out there in the public? <laughs> St uh, speak loud. It's a protected profession, no? Mm -hmm. So it helped me a lot in defending since, and maybe this is happening also to other faculties, no? We are under pressure in the university system mm -hmm. because we are not doing enough research, so they are cutting us. Mm -hmm. So I'm relying on the protected profession. At the same time, we continue to be not recognized as research discipline, no? So sometimes that's a catch-22 situation, no? Because we want to be recognized as research discipline. Exactly. Since we are doing research that is necessary for all the challenges you are naming, no? And the third, I would say the third component, no? That, that through your great project comes in that, I don't know how to define it, maybe to say architectural, cultural, and creative industries in an extended sense somehow, no? That, that uh, together with the protected profession and with research is not only enlarging, but the very interesting thing is that the interaction between these parts makes really the true uh, characteristic of architecture, no? That, and very very this, nicely said, thanks, but uh, we are, there were some more hands. Uh, no, and this is difficult no, to, I to know, communicate yeah. in the university. Exactly, no? that's the point, that's the point, thanks. Uh, there were some more hands. Thank you. My name is Ole Gustafsson and I'm coming from the Oslo School of Architecture and Design. Thank you all for these comments and I would like to urge the EAAE to have more discussions, more things like this because we absolutely need it and I think we all should remember Thomas saying that we all what did you say we don't like things the way they are but we don't want to change them either and we should also remember that there's so many ways to roam and I'm like others here in an under committee to the EU Commission that accredited architectural educations in Europe. Wow, that's the forest of schools. It's incredible. Bologna is, is not acting across Europe. And Norway is outside all this. We don't have the list. We have a different list. I think you would like it. <laughs> so, but I think we should continue to discuss uh, because we need to do it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ilaria. Thank you, thank you for the discussion. I am Ilaria Valente, Politecnico di Milano. Uh, I think that uh, the most important step in inclusiveness is to uh, better understand the story of our graduates. And also the, uh, the more advanced trends that we have now in education in, uh, uh, in our School of Architecture. I want to face the problem of internationalization and so the problem of Bologna. And uh, some projects that we have now, for example, in, 
in a network of technical universities with universities to create global campuses. Mm -hmm. um, Ivan knows very well about the enhanced project. And then we have Alliance for Tech between uh, Poligny uh, at San Madrid, uh, UCL London, uh, Central Supelec, and, and uh, Politecnico di Milano. Um, and the idea is that students could uh, study a semester or three months and get credits in other universities. And those students could have very different stories. Huh? Uh, could be a Polymy student with three years at Polymy and, uh, and then in the master get credits in all those cities. Or could be also, I give us an example, an African student enrolled at, at Polymy that then has this kind of experience. It's clear that that moment of the enrollment we check his or her preparation about the European rules. Huh? But we have a population of students that could be very articulated. And they carry with them their culture and they carry with them inclusiveness. So we have to be very uh, responsible and open at the level of the schools in the moment of the enrollment and accreditation of the titles and then the organizations, the chambers of architects, the national rules have to be uh, open to this kind of reality because this one is the new reality of the profession of architecture. So just to, to remember that. Thank Thank, uh, thanks, Ilaria. Um, okay, Mia and then Oya. And one thing, Sally, and then we have to stop because it's late and hot. <laughs> and our guests, uh, keynote speakers, are already here. <laughs> yeah. I'll be really short. Uh, I'm Mia Roth um, from many places, from the Zagreb School of Architecture, from the EAA, but here I'm speaking from the afterlife. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to address uh, the question that came up several times here. It is the graduates not knowing anything about practice uh, when they enter it. Uh, after graduation because this is something that we agree upon but for some it has a good uh, meaning and for some it has a negative meaning and herein in this interpretation lies the danger um, because uh, as uh, Dubravko in the second uh, comment point pointed out very well is uh, we shouldn't be aiming for concrete vocational knowledge we should aim for educating all of these things that we can't before because they will learn it through practice. It changes, Michael put it uh, very, very precisely. So in that sense, I think there is a need to be more explicit maybe in the direction because it can be understood as it is now from both sides and perhaps misused in this sense. And another comment on um, Manuel's uh, remark, yes, everything is architecture, and this is what the study is trying to point out, because on one hand, we have architecture as a mindset, and on the other hand, we have its legislative uh, definition. And herein also lies a certain uh, misunderstanding, because there's a difference between uh, just architectural practice in a normative sense and architecture as a way of thinking and a way of operating and a habitus. And that's why in all of our interviews, um, people not in practice still identify as architects because they are. So it's a matter of recognizing the elasticity of, of the discipline, which is also something that can then be legislatively advocated for. Thanks, Mia. Sally, and then we round up with Oya. Thank you. As a quietly spoken Scot, I'll take the mic. Um, I'm two, two points I'd like to make, one funny, one serious. The funny one isn't perhaps that funny. I probably am a member of the Deviant registration now. I'm not longer allowed to call myself an architect because I'm not registered in our board in the UK. I can't even say that I qualified as an architect. Now, I don't say that because I'm against protection. But I am, against, I am against things that um, provide rules which 
turn people off actually being members of our profession and recognising the skill set that they have, particularly when they reach the end of their education. The, the point that I would like to make, and I've kind of mentioned this to a couple of people over the last couple of days, is that I think we're in the dan danger of having students who are highly qualified. They have enormous amounts of knowledge and understanding that I didn't have when I was a student, when I qualified, but they have now. And we also have a profession that has to catch up. And I'm really interested in how um, CPD can move to a much more serious level so that it can engage with universities mm -hmm. who are providing in-depth education at all sorts of levels, dealing with all the things we've talked about in NEB and all the things that we're talking about today, diversity, equality, engagement, commitment to communities, etc. So how does the profession come back towards the schools and use them as tools, use them as providers for really serious CPD. And I think it's, it's professional bodies that can help us to do that, to, to, to recognize that, because I think that's the next challenge. Not that the generation of architects we are educating at the moment are not going to be able to enter the profession, but we're going to have a gap. We're going to have a gap of 15 years of lack of skill set that we really need to be, meet the challenges um, that Ruth mentioned. Thanks, Ellie. Thank One more point from Oya. Well, it will be a wrap-up. We all, or most of us, studied architecture. We were all once students. And most of our faculty is still working, practicing architects. So please, look at the mirror and ask yourself, what is your inner compass? And what are you giving to your students? Thank you very much for this meeting. And uh, thanks to the members of the round table. Thanks, Manuel Edsam and Madrid, allowing for these discussions to be continued. Thanks. Yes. To be continued in April. So we will tell you more about the date. Short, let's be. Oh, yeah? What? Okay, déjalo.
Sí, 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 puedes usar el teclado, sí, si quieres. Sí, como estoy más cómodo, sí, me digo, como estoy más cómodo. Si estoy más cómodo en la mesa, teclado, no, 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 Sí, eso es lo que dice, eso es bien que chico. Mi vecino. La música está en la calle. Yo no he querido que fuera solamente escuela, pero si quería que fuera escuela. Y el que era su hijo, su hijo, su hijo. Bien, bien, no, bien. Y luego Carmen y los otros. Sí, que el chico, el chico está bien. Y con todas esas políticas de ahí, bien perfecto. Todos hablan. Sí, exacto. ¿Eh? Claro, yo he tenido que hacer eso. ¿Sabes? 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 ¿Cómo es que hacemos? ¿Nos sentamos? Sí, lo que queráis. ¿Lo queréis? ¿Yo? No, yo prefiero estar ahí. Vale, pues entonces lo que, lo que prefieras. Yo prefiero estar ahí. No, pero si es que nos sentamos, es que, es que la gente es lo que prefiere estar ahí. Prefiere verte ahí. ¿Los peleéis vosotros? Están cansados. ¿Mm? Ok, por favor. Bueno, que no sé. Que aquí... Pues entonces si te quedas tú aquí, quédate aquí en esa parte. It's for me a real pleasure to introduce two wonderful professors of my school that has been teaching also everywhere. Uh, Iñaki Ábalos and Renata Sienkiewicz. And sorry because I said Iñaki Ábalos and Renata Sienkiewicz, but they were by order of appearance in, in my life. Iñaki uh, studied with me. We okay. studied together. We are from the same year uh, in this school. And afterwards, we had the luck to incorporate to our life, <laughs> maybe thanks to you, but to our life <laughs> at Renata. And Renata is even in my team because Renata is one of the leaders of the uh, Office of the Bureau of Sustainability of the School of Architecture. By the way, a, a bureau we organize it only with women. It's not that we don't believe, be, believe that men uh, don't believe in sustainability, but we wanted that twist. Okay, uh, they have won all kind of awards. I think they, they are the most awarded people we have in our, in our faculty, in our staff. Uh, Iñaki has been also chair of GSD in Harvard. You know that uh, very well. They have been teaching in Cornell, in Yale. They have been teaching in Harvard, uh, both of them, in all kind of European schools. You know all of them. And the architecture they make, they are always interested in the territory, in the landscape, and how sustainability is uh, working. When they discovered that uh, we were working with the New European Bauhaus uh, in this Congress, they started to make suggestions, to make questions. So that is their punishment, to be talking to you and to be a part uh, of the Congress. Because if they were so interested in what the Congress was going to be, let's then be a part uh, of us. So I gave the floor to them. I still don't know if they are going to talk standing up or sitting. But maybe we'll have a divorce with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. I think I'm 
Yeah, I, th I think I'm, I'm going to be standing and, and she will be sad. Oh, I'm moving. Okay, anyway. right. Okay. <laughs> so, nice. thank you for the introduction, uh, Manolo. We, we were studying together and in the same table. So, so <laughs> we, we were gossiping while the instructor was giving his lesson. I remember quite well. Uh, okay, uh, we have prepared uh, um, a presentation. I know that we, you are tired, so we try to, to make a kind of, of let's say, uh, easy. Mm. Close to. Okay. Uh, we are going to make it easier uh, and very visual, I, I, I hope. Well, we, we call it new primitivism because it's a, a way that we, a term that we invented that. Uh, in fact, it's, it's uh, wanted to, to, to say something very similar to, to what the new Bauhaus wants to say. You know? So, and this is why we, uh, the, subter, the subtitle is to say some thermodynamics. <clears throat> this is the world. This is a Norman Foster thing that I'm, I've been very critic with it. It's too optimistic. I mean, I, I don't believe that COVID has made such a, a, a big change. I mean. Uh, Normally, we all, when we suffer bad situations, something that is um, demonstrated by a psychologist is that we forget, we completely forget very easily. And this is what probably is going to happen uh, with all the, let's say, ideas and, and revolutions that, uh, that were invented in those days. Uh, but what I know is that the world has become a huge factory and a very weak, weak one and that we have to, to, to really understand that, uh, that our work belongs to a kind of very complex structure. And th the other thing that I think is important is that uh, working is not so bad. Uh, work is very interesting if you are able to enjoy it. And there are very important uh, books, much more important than the Norman Foster chart, uh, to understand how much uh, the profession of architect is, is related with both things, with uh, the homo ludens, with enjoying, and with working with infrastructure, with staff, with industrial staff. <coughs> These are our, um, let's say, bosses, the bosses of the world. Uh, well, there's a, a fourth one that I have omitted, and, uh, but uh, the three of them are try, um, trying to, with more honesty or less honesty, trying to invest in a kind of change in the way we conceive the, let's say, the, the space, uh, the built space, uh, the carbon neutrality. I, I, I have to say that we, we uh, in, in our office, and I think m many of us in this room, prefer the, 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 the Ursula von der Leyen, let's say, take on the, on the, on these issues that we are dealing with. Uh, the three parts. Uh, for us are really, I mean, I like the, the structure in three big names. Beautiful, sustainable, together, or together messy. Inclusiveness, sustainability, uh, new aesthetics. I think that is very clear and very suggestive um, and a wonderful way to synthesize many things that uh, uh, can look like, in, in, term, in a panoramic term, can look like too confusing, but with these three terms become much more clear. And the other one that uh, we are always working with is this, this scheme of the MacArthur Foundation, uh, which <coughs> is too idealistic, maybe, but and somehow um, is giving all of us some directions that are very clear. I have to say that, uh, as, as Manolo has pointed out, we've been teaching and, and, and writing some books that uh, have been important for us and, and maybe for uh, some students, <laughs> Tower and Office, in long time ago. This one was the first thing that I published at the GSD, thermodynamics applied to high-rise and mixed-use prototypes that is very much in the same line than, than the Ursula von der Leyen um, uh, understanding of what is going to be the new uh, aesthetic. And, and this one is m even more close. No? It, was, it was made in 2013 to 15 or to 16. And it's on, say it's on thermodynamics, architecture, and beauty. No? It can look like a post-Ursula book, but it's not. <laughs> well, uh, <clears throat> so we are going to present like a, a, a panorama of, of, of projects that in some ways have some relationship with, with the topics of, of, 
of, uh, that we are dealing with, with in, in Europe. Well, this first one is the uh, recycling plant, the biggest in those days, in, in 1999 uh, in Europe. And it, was, uh, it received a lot of, uh, mm, let's say, awards. The, 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 this, the, this is the, 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 it's not a rendering, it's a collage that we prepared for the competition that wanted to, to say that now, seen now, is very, very clear. It wants to say that the, the whole infrastructure had to mimic the, the slope where it is located. The, the recycling plant uh, works with gravity, so, so somehow it has three steps and the roof replicates, the, let's say, the slopes and the, it's green, it's the same green than the surroundings, that is, uh, is a park. Orange. Well, yeah, it's, it's Spanish green. And, um, <laughs> and, and so you see also the, the, the whole area where it is located in the uh, southeast of, of Madrid has a kind of uh, its own, let's say, lexicon in, in the contemporary painting, some of the most famous painters of, of, of Madrid in the, at the beginning of the 20th century were painting things that we have mimicked very clearly. Well, this is the location. Yeah. The, the whole uh, in, uh, thing. And, and for us, the, 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 the scheme was uh, very interesting to, to work with industry and, and to try to, to synthesize what we understood that wo was possible to make in, in an, an industrial plant like the recycling plant. <clears throat> in this case, mm, the roof is one, one important part, but it's not only, uh, the only thing. The other one is to, to really compact everything and to be able to introduce public uh, spaces to visit the, the, the installation. In fact, the, the, this proposal was the winner, uh, the, the winning entry of uh, uh, the, the most uh, important in economic uh, terms uh, competition of uh, the municipality of, of Madrid for 25 years. So, so it's going to finish its use in a couple of years. And what we decided to introduce under the roof, you see here, are two things. One thing is a natural light and a very simple structure. It's super cheap. But also the way the workers uh, walk to their positions, you see the stair that goes down. We increase the width one and a half meter more than the regulation. So it could ad adapt for visits of schools and students, at, especially in the morning, where the, the garbage is basically orange because of the orange fruit <laughs> that passes through the, the, the trams. And, and it, it, they can visit it and see all the process and understand uh, how much uh, recycling is embedded in our everyday life. And this was what gave the, our proposal like three points that were that, that what gave the let's say the company uh, the the winning entry. The other thing is that we wanted to for the first time we insisted in in working with um, uh, um, uh, polycarbonate uh, secondhand polycarbonate and recycled polycarbonate, and it was really tough to, to get it, but we got it. We had to travel like two times to, to Germany to persuade them to at least give us this product for the same price that a new one, <laughs> and we got that. And then the, there is an, a patio that separates, let's say, offices and, and the uh, industrial staff, and with offices and, and, and all the uh, other uh, spaces that goes up to the roof and that uh, gives you like a sensation of, of having like a kind of community, you know, some, some kind of, uh, let's say, natural way to stay there. <clears throat> the interiors, the place where the trucks just leave the, the, the stuff, and you see the T-shape at the end is where the trucks uh, are weighted. I mean, they wait with the, uh, with the staff uh, when they go in and without the staff, and the difference of, of weight is what gives the money to the companies. It's very simple. Well, this was <clears throat> important for us because it was about recycling, it was about the recycling garbage, it was about using the same, let's say, the same tactic with our design than the process itself, <clears throat> and introducing, a, let's say, a didactical role that was not expected. In, in a few years later, we won this competition in Barcelona. It's the last corner of Barcelona, the last uh, um, beach, artificial beach, by the way. 
and and we we won it like it was fantastic. The competition was only two A3s. It's fantastic to win a competition that uh, took us one day and a half no, to, to to work. So it was incredible. I mean, in those days, Barcelona was paradise. I have to say, and. Uh, well, it's, it's, uh, the whole area was known as Chernobyl, so it was not, let's say, the most interesting place of the whole Forum 2004 area. And we obviously went for this because we knew they were having to uh, adapt to the new European regulations. We knew that it embedded to change the way the garbage was treated and creating a, a, a new recycling plant, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. And we won it. So the, the whole idea of the, of the project was to somehow uh, adapt the, the, the fact that we could uh, create a green park and, and the last beach of the city in this corner that was a kind of very radically detested by the citizens. And, and this is why uh, mostly everything is green and every green you see is hiding uh, different stuff, technological stuff. This is the recycling plant, by the way, uh, but it is hidden the incineradora. I don't know the, how they say it in English, the, the old one in black. <coughs> it's low, and then it has this kind of important building that is receiving you into the area uh, that is looking to the sea. The Mediterranean Sea is giving it its color, and it has the offices, the public activities, and also some digesters that are wrapped with the polycarbonate, the, the blue polycarbonate. Well, you can see the, 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 the whole, <coughs> the, the rest of the area was already there. We had to, meet, to, to understand how to, to uh, intervene in this chaos, you know, in this uh, place that has so many negative uh, Connotations, and we thought that creating a collage, a kind of patchwork of different things, like a cubist collage, was a, a good tactic. All things had almost the same size and proportion, so there is not a kind of, uh, um, <coughs> let's say, complexity. No, it's a, a kind of a simple way to understand and and and. and see if you like it or not, uh, or you don't like it. I think it's, it's very well used, by the, by, by the way, and it has become a strange place, but a strange place that has its uh, adepts. Uh, well, this is the, the, this, the fake hill that hides uh, a lot of storm tanks, uh, water storm uh, tanks, and, and recycling and garbage um, the technology. <coughs> <clears throat> is the green submarine, we call it. Um, and here is inside uh, all the stuff that no one wants. We, we uh, create this, this hill. The hill is also in the, in the last corner of the park. You see the, the, the Mediterranean Sea. <clears throat> and this is the kind of collage. So the right side of the image is what was already there and was very difficult to dis dismantle. And, and the, the blue building is like hidden in, fr in the entrance, but then when you go in, it, it creates a kind of interesting relationship. And this is what you see when you are up in the, in, in the, on the building. You see, the, let's say, the more, uh, let's say, con conflictive uh, neighborhood of, of, of Barcelona. Uh, now it's much more well known because Rosalia, the singer, comes from this neighborhood. And, but it was like uh, everyone was saying, don't, don't contact with, with that neighborhood. For us, it was very important to create this, this uh, contact. No? La Mina, yeah. So this is why the, this, has this, this shape, this pavement has this trumpet shape. It goes be, below the, the, the highway, uh, contacting directly with uh, this part. No? And it has worked quite well. And we have also invited Albert Erlen, the, the painter, to help us with creating something very popular, very pop, very, we wanted to make something that everyone could understand, and he, he was living then in Spain, and had a, a, in his kitchen had a poster with the fishes of the Mediterranean Sea, and, and said, don't worry, I'll give you a solution for one day. And it was this, and, and then we had some uh, mathematician transforming this into dots of concrete of 10 by 10 centimeters, uh, with a palette of colors that are standard, and for the same price, the homogeneous color uh, concrete styles uh, <coughs> uh, pavement. So, uh, 
it's, it's like this, and it, especially, I mean, sometimes with the, the dirty of the, the, the dust of, of the air, it doesn't look so nice, but when it's rainy and it's clear, it's, it's fantastic. And this is, uh, talking about inclusiveness, this is exactly what we like about the, this park. It's not a kind of fantastic in terms of nature or whatever. It has very simple nature. It, it's, everything is, is, is simple. But we created these benches saying we need people coming here to, to, to just have a drink and stay a couple of hours with their colleagues and that's it. And when, we, when Jose Evia was the photographer, when they uh, ca captured this image that represents exactly what we were thinking to, to produce. Please. I directly follow. It's okay, the voice? Yeah. Okay, so we go to, to another project. This is a sport pavilion in Retiro Park in, in Madrid. Uh, so probably it's not so easy to see it. And uh, this, this was uh, our goal. We, this was what we wanted, uh, this effect we want to, um, to get in the project. Uh, probably most of you know Retiro Park. Uh, it's, uh, Take, has a lot of uh, centuries. Uh, originally, it was a garden for a king palace, and it was growing. And at the beginning of 19th century, it became public park. And nowadays, uh, it's uh, the most important uh, park of Madrid in, in historical center, no? and has around 118 uh, hectares and uh, create kind of, it's kind of long that ventilates all the old city. No? And this uh, red rectangular, it's, uh, there are sport facilities, so we were asked to work with a sport pavilion to add the architecture in this historical park that it's not so uh, easy, it's, it's a challenge, no? so we were studying uh, folies, uh, pavilions, materialities of all different elements that exist in the park or exist in some moments along of the history. No? And uh, we wanted to bring some of these uh, references to the project and at the same time work with uh, modernist uh, systems. No? So what we propose, these are the images of the project, they are not photos, no, first, first ideas, uh, work with uh, what we call arte topiaria, no? so metal uh, light construct construction, uh, meshes, uh, vegetation that here are very small, uh, but traduce it to a very simple and uh, cheap uh, also building and very simple geometry. And uh, this, is a, this is a building you can see in the section to the right. We, want, we do not want to make a big volume, so uh, we need double high space for gym or for sport activities. So we get to the underground, and this way also uh, we get a better um, um, thermodynamic uh, condition, let's say, no? so most of the sport uh, room, it's under the ground, the concrete, it's in relation with the ground, with the st stability of the temperature along of the year, so it's quite helpful to reduce uh, air condition inside. No? And over this big room, uh, there is an outside tennis court. No? On the left, you have see the plan, a uh, big double high room and two floors of uh, changing room. The access and two floors of changing room for these facilities, but also for all exterior sport fields. So this is this inner, inner space with the light from the upper part. We use here as well polycarbonate to diffuse the light, but also to bring a kind of privacy uh, for people that make sports inside. And this is the upper part, the exterior tennis court. So the dimension of the building, it's giving a dimension of tennis court, 16 for 36. There are some, some images with plants starting to grow. And that they bring also these colors, depend of the season, to the inside of the building. This, during the night, it's kind of lamp, we could say, as well. Uh, some images, you have Iñaki in the upper part. 
and uh, very, very simple uh, uh, construction with meshes, with some planters in the perimeter of tennis court and in some lower parts as well. Now you can see here the two floors and the roof plan, no? the, the pavilion almost disappeared. This is a plan of all sport facilities and you can see uh, elevations in the upper and right part. So the pavilion mimic with the trees because of the high, because of the colors, and because of the vegetation as well. Some details of the entrance, the stairs to the roof, the interior, very simple industrial construction. And uh, uh, again, the inside sport double high part. Oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and with this, we finish and we go to another pavilion as well in the park. In this case, we are in China, in Shanghai, and uh, it's a church. So um, it was a new, it, it's a new district uh, that it's made from people from outside, uh, from most Europe, uh, American. So to be friendly, somehow they bring uh, different facilities like uh, English school, etc., and also they the um, authorities decide to construct the Christian church. No? And this is this red site, very narrow one, between the road and the underground metro, so quite limited. And here it's a, it's a model of a project. And uh, um, it's a, at the same time you start to see here that it's kind of a gate, no? so it was one of the first decisions. And uh, it, how to uh, work with the form of the church, but at the same time find the relation with the park. No? And this photo, it's a real photo of constructed uh, element. The, the water was much more extended. It was important element. And, uh, and the constructed uh, building and relation of the water, the river, and the landscape, all elements together. So the, the building, it's very, um, very simple, uh, have a very simple uh, organization, divided in two because we want to maintain this gate to the park, the offices to the left side and the chapel to the right side, of course with the parking in the underground. <laughs> and uh, you see here the, the, the chapel, how it extends and create this amphitheater. We are talking about Christian church, so it's kind of social place for meeting for a lot of uh, Mm, things may, can happen inside also for a community. Uh, so the chapel can be divided in, in a main on the left and a small one with this skylight from north side. Huh? On the left you have the uh, offices and in the middle the gate to the park with the tower with bells that for us at the same time it's a chimney that through buoyancy ventilate all this uh, corridor. Huh? So uh, the, the green roof, of course, uh, help in the insulation from sun radiation, but as well this double, double ceiling in the, in the main chapel with double <coughs> slab uh, create uh, increase also insulation from, from the upper part. And the deformation of the roof we use for a small amphitheater for ceremonies. I will show photos later. Uh, for weddings, for instance, not so, so much important in, in, in China. No? So this is a facade to the urban uh, uh, exterior, let's say, and this one is to the park that start to break much more geometry and you can perceive that there is this connection, these big stairs that are going up to connect with the chapel and also with the roof. The materiality, we work with the kind of plint, much more tectonic, concrete, with strong texture, and in the also used for the interior of our tower, chimney, bells, etc. Uh, that help with, uh, also with the sound. <clears throat> and the upper part, uh, it's very simple, just white painting, and the complexity, it's through the geometry of, of the volume. Now, this is an entrance from the parking to the church. And the inside uh, chapel, it's a long uh, space uh, with this bali hanging of concrete in the upper part and uh, some very uh, precisely defined openings for the light uh, coming from up, coming from west, from the right side. The connection of the, the movable doors to the upper, upper chapel 
balcony, this is the entrance, and the uh, altar that beyond you have another opening with very specific light and connection with, uh, with the offices, with the other building through the stairs. The west small opening that filter just um, you know, lines almost of, of light, very deep narrow windows, and this is the upper chapel that connect with the stairs you know, and the balcony. Uh, outside stairs that bring to the roof with this small amphitheater, but at the same time, it's a place, it's a viewpoint to the near park, but also to the river that you could perceive from far. And some final images of whole volume, these stairs with the light for the park, the roof, and the final photo, uh, increasing this volume with relation with the lake, artificial lake, in, in, the, in the park. So the final, final photo, I think it's the last one. And we go to another pavilion, we come back to Spain. And uh, we are near Madrid, <coughs> it's a small city in 40 kilometers from Madrid, very industrial, very typical, the agriculture, road, industry, train, and the city. No? So in the city, um, the authorities decide to create kind of leisure center. Uh, it's, uh, it was 2009-10, um, so it was a kind of uh, crisis moment, a very high uh, percent of people without job. So this would be the place that they can meet, uh, uh, they can re-educate, they can have uh, cultural activities. So it was a competition that we, uh, that we win. And uh, these are the first uh, sketches. This is a slow building in the further part in front of the park. And uh, this is a model. So um, we decide to make like kind of sequence of rooms all in the ground floor, completely accessible. Uh, rooms that can change uh, program uh, in a long of a time. They can adapt to different uh, activities. They are um, different. They have different proportions: long, square. Some of them are open to the south, some to the north. Uh, some exterior also as well. And um, the the program basically the way we organize it that the south openings are for more static activities. Cafeteria when you are just sitting and resting. And the north uh, part, it's more a sport, gym, uh, when you are moving. No? Uh, so it's, it's kind of a uh, factory, we would say. No? It's very industrial construction also. Uh, with these two courtyards, we could get natural cross ventilation. We are uh, working with a geothermal and uh, uh, photo and, and photovoltaic uh, energy and also with the landscape that trees use as a shadow and the water ponds for uh, adiabatic, uh, adiabatic uh, cooling of exterior spaces. The section, what was important also to have real uh, high, this is more than four meters, so it works very well in summer, all the heat is going to the upper part and you have this insulation with a green that in, in Mediterranean uh, climate, uh, summers are dry, so it works very well as uh, insulation. The very simple 555 uh, structure, a uh, metal one. Uh, here you have uh, photos from construction site. The uh, metal deck, just as a roof. And the, and the glass that follow exactly the models of, of a structure. And the roof, that it's uh, adapt very dry kind of uh, vegetation with uh, quite low maintenance needed, that become also the fifth facade for surrounding buildings, because it's quite, it's quite visible. The op open space, the portic, let's say, of the cafeteria with this canopy, water, trees that here are really small. <laughs> it's all some years ago. Now we are much bigger and they are working much better. Uh, that can work differently along of a year. Courtyard for different uses. And the inside, uh, the interior, that uh, it's, we work with very simple finishing. Uh, 
painting, white, dark gray, light gray, and this climbing or climbing of, of wood, just some millimeters, you know, to give uh, um, complexity and character to different rooms. You know? So we are changing down, up, and we are moving all different finishing finishes uh, depending on the uh, effect we want to, to, to look for. And this is the auditorium, let's say, or big room for dancing or whatever, what can happen there. Uh, you can see the ceiling, it just, uh, you see the structure, the, the metal deck, there's no, no much complexity. And uh, here's some photos already from, with people, you know, the, the library, the meeting room that uh, become meeting for a uh, woman to shoot. So it was, for us, was funny visiting it when the people start to use it. They make very different things, we were thinking at the beginning, but it become very uh, active place and very popular. So this, for us, it's a, a satisfaction. No? The art room, the cafeteria, and some, some images from the north, when you get the north light, and finally all the, all the palette, let's say, of, of the materials, no? the south facade. And uh, we jump to another, maybe not so much pavilion, we go to the city in this case, and that's, that's a project of a uh, foundation, of, uh, foundation of Antoni Tapies, probably you know most of you the building, it's place in uh, en Sanche Cerda uh, that has very uh, modern in these times uh, establishment to mix what it's dwelling with production, no, with factories. So originally it was printing uh, company and in 80s of last century uh, it became foundation of Antoni Tapies. I do not have a photo of this moment, but let's say that it was uh, kind of um, very typical postmodern. Uh, colors and materials, etc., uh, adequate to the time, but maybe not so well received by Antoni Tapies. So um, we uh, were asked, in reality, the original um, um, commission. Original commission was to adequate the building to uh, regulations. So it was question of doors, stairs, whatever. And it was growing in the discussion, conversation, and uh, it became a much bigger project. Huh? Even uh, a part of restoration include a new piece that here, new week that you have see here to the left huh? uh, for offices. But uh, originally the office uh, were in the upper part, and it was like 20 people working in the place with uh, spiral stairs of 50 centimeters wide to get in, so it was completely out of any security. No? So we proposed this new wing, and uh, we proposed this also different thinking about the foundation, not so much uh, as a museum when you, you just go to see the art, but uh, think about it like a, much more like a factory of art, let's say. So give visibility to the offices, to the people working, the, to, to the meeting rooms, to the library, uh, to the exhibition, that all the spaces that are related with the art uh, can be open to a pub public visible. No? <coughs> so this is, a, this is a section of the project. On the left side up, you have the original one. So the offices, we moved to the new wing. And also uh, what we detect that the, this complex uh, roof was bringing a lot of direct light through the skylight to the exhibition. So direct ra radiation it's, um, well, work very badly with the exhibition of art. So what we propose to enclose it, you will see photos later, with a surface, uh, it's kind of um, textile, plastic textile, we call it uh, barisol, that uh, make, diffuse, diffuse the light and also enclose the exhibition space. This way we reduce the volume of the exhibition and uh, we uh, get at the end of the definition of the project that all MEP space that were originally, even we increased like 1,000 square meters, the building, um, the MEP machines work exactly the same. It was not any needness to, to increase them. 
and uh, the, the, what we were bringing is just rediscover the original building. So bring back uh, metal uh, columns, uh, the original ceiling, uh, white uh, color, the floor uh, we make with uh, wood, but it's um, uh, industrial wood, kind of small bricks. Trying to, to, to bring again this um, atmosphere of a original printing company, no? the space. Hey, sorry. This is a, a library, and you can see this uh, barisol, this textile. This is a roof. It like, looks like kind of white, but it's just enclosing that diffuse and bring homogeneous natural light to the exhibition. Maybe you can see it here as well. Some interior and uh, and the new wing. Um, the idea was constructed like it would be constructed industrial interior or industrial facade if we would make it today. No, so we use exactly the same models, only that the uh, profile metal are coming from nowadays construction. It's very simple. You can see the, the facade that gives visibility to people working. Again, some exhibition space to finish. And the last um, idea added in the project is this uh, opening to the courtyard. So normally all the public uh, buildings are open to the street and the people that are not from Barcelona but are visiting from outside, they do not have this uh, possibility to know, to understand the inner courtyard, which are very typical for Ensanche uh, in Barcelona. So we make this small room to get to the outside and to bring this small exterior space inside of a courtyard. And uh, Antoni Tapies bring here the sculpture that was never exhibited. It was sculpture from long time, but in its moment, the politic situation did not let to, to be shown. And with this, I finish the project, and we bring, if you, Iñaki, want to add something and follow with. Yeah, yes. Yes. I, I had two projects very quickly, and we stop. <laughs> so I see all of you with this kind of. <laughs> <laughs> stuff <laughs> it is super hot yeah uh, this is uh, these two are more urban I mean we had first the infrastructural <clears throat> Renata has been dealing with the cultural so to, to speak and and these are like more urban this was a competition we won in Logroño in La Rioja that you were planning to go tomorrow but you don't go and it's a wonderful place wonderful wine by the way and it was uh, it's a small city in in, in, in Spain and but are very important, and we won the competition because we discovered, we just try to, to study, let's say, uh, stuff that we find, uh, historical documents, etc. and this was very important. The Logroño has the Rio, the, the biggest river of Spain passing through, and so the, let's say the subterranean earth is, is full of irrigation channels and stuff that are very strange in Spain, Water is not so easy to find. <laughs> so we immediately, this was the state of the place. Then they wanted to sunk in the high speed train passing through. And this was our model uh, that instead of creating icons, created a hill, a kind of strange shape, hill, with, surrounded by uh, turrets and, and slabs. No? And, and so compared to, to other. Uh, um, model of the competition was completely a kind of UFO, no? but the whole idea was to use the, the local conditions to create public space and to instead of what was previously a wall separating north and south of the city economically and socially, create a kind of huge public space, green public space that decarbonize, create a kind of microclimate, all the stuff that you know. I'm not going to, to speak about that. Um, so uh, the whole shape is, is um, based in a kind of tri triangular pattern because we didn't want to spend too much money. So the structure is triangular to, uh, to create this kind of shapes. And then the parterres of the park became a kind of very bizarre, so to speak, but very interesting because the, the whole thing 
acquire a kind of a specific character. Uh, this is the roof with some skylights, very few of them. This is the train station and the park. And this is the interior. The interior mimics the exterior, and the exterior mimics the interior, but in different shapes, I mean, in different ways. In, uh, the interior is, is always recycled aluminum. It's, it's always artificial uh, uh, materials. Uh, the, the exterior is always natural. And this contrast, in somehow it creates the, let's say, the, the, let's say the, 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 the character of the place. This is the place where you go in uh, and, and to the train station, and then wait for the train here. You see you the skylight is introducing the, the, the light into the way you go down to the tracks. And then up, you have, the, let's say, the same the contrast, but with the same character. No? And this is the way it was constructed. The, we decided we had a complex engineering companies working with the train issues, with the structural issues, with energy issues. So we decided to create a, a line that separated their staff and our staff. And, and then the, uh, here you see it. Engineers, architects. <laughs> but at the same time, it's uh, translucent. I mean, you see through. So when you walk in this place, the, the whole uh, uh, place is, I mean, you always walk in the station. You go and, uh, in and out, and then the whole uh, station is like alive with you, no? and creates this kind of shapes. Not in the in, not in this place where you receive the the, 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 the trains because they, it had to be low, so we just left the concrete. But with these skylights pumping up, which create a kind of uh, let's say surreal promenade, no? and, yeah. and then. <coughs> Uh, we went for the second step was the, the bus station. The bus station has this kind of typical shape, the horse, uh, I don't know how they call it, the, uh, the, the rounded uh, uh, shape that uh, works well. And in between both, uh, we decided to, uh, they had, we had to prepare a space because there were general systems had to cross the city, so we created a kind of dome, uh, which is here in the moment that it has its its uh, central shape uh, being lifted up, and uh, the south uh, park, the other park, with this stuff that is interesting. And this is the, I, I don't want to go to, to, uh, uh, into details. The, the bus station basically is uh, um, going up to the sky while the train station goes down into the earth. Uh, and in this case, the stir, uh, this orange stir, is, is the protagonist of the space. You have the light, and it go, goes like almost uh, in, in a very, let's say, hidden uh, way uh, structurally. It goes up to the light and conduce and, and drives people to the uh, small cafe, uh, looking to the park. And then in the middle of both, there is a seven, uh, sixty-seven uh, uh, meters span and dome. Uh, that creates a kind of uh, gate for the, for the city and also what uh, separates and links the north and south of the city. These are the two directions it has. Um, <coughs> and you see here the, the both both uh, places, no? the park and... and uh, uh, no, no, no function. Eh? I have to go and... St ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. And this is, is very is, is very short. Should explain that the, the, yeah. Uh, the balloon. Yeah, the balloon is an intervention of a spy and artist last last year, and it's fantastic. And now there is another is Konstantin Girik having another let's say intervention. And and ah, oh, it's music. <laughs> Thank you. We made it with Teresa Galli, the landscaper, the park, with a lot of people. The whole thing has been the second Briam urbanism uh, in Spain. So, uh, yeah, the second urbanism, uh, Briam, <laughs> well, which is, is important.
But the most important thing is that it's very well received by the city and the, especially by the neighbors that are super happy to have this now, this wonderful space where they didn't have anything. Yeah, and this is the last, very quickly. Uh, again, we come back to Shanghai. <laughs> We, we have, this is a, 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 a project that has been built without being visiting. We visited only once at the beginning, before COVID and stuff, stuff, and we didn't want to stay 20 days paying ourselves the hotel just to make a visit to the work and come back. No, it was a, a too, too much. WeChat is okay. Well, this place is a fantastic place of Shanghai. It's where all the industrialization of, of China, not only Shanghai, began with the textile industry. And it's in the Jampu River, as the river is 400 meters width, it's huge. It's still an industrial, uh, well, the, those of you that know it you will, will recognize it. No? And the bridge is, is the, the biggest bridge over the, uh, over the river. And we had this, this corner of a urban plan, 2,500,000 uh, uh, square meters built. Uh, almost 1 million is re. re uh, uh, reconsidering the, all the industrial stuff that, that, that was there. We won the competition because we were um, offering a strategy that was it's very simple. It's, uh, we were thinking on five different systems, uh, ec ecological systems that relate uh, to each other. No? And, and then with individualizing uh, these ecosystems, we could really understand how the, the whole thing could perform in, let's say, in, in sustainable ways and, and decarbonize the area, create cultural activities, also technological activities, and, and create a kind of uh, public space for the neighborhoods that were completely out of, of this kind of, of um, let's say, uh, facilities and, and increasing the, for the quality of life in, in there. I'm, I'm, if, if I begin to explain it, I spend one hour, and you don't want to hear me one hour, so I know. <laughs> yeah, believe me, it, it, it was a kind of uh, incredible, it was in incredible to win it. We were, in those days, we were 11 in the office, and we were uh, competing against the five biggest engineer companies in the world. I mean, the, the smaller was 2,000, and we won. So it was a great pleasure. And these, these are some of the factories that now uh, will begin to be studied, uh, how to, to transform. We propose some, some, some ways to include uh, programs that were related with historical issues, but also with, with sport facilities and also with, let's say, trying to attend different populations, young kids, uh, workers, uh, locals, etc. Well, I'm, I'm not going to explain all this because it, it, it can take a lot. But this is super complex. It has three levels of, 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 of movement. Uh, and this is uh, all the energy system. It uses the water of the river uh, in the system of, of, of air conditioning of the system, and also photovoltaics and in different key points. And this is the central part and the one that we are, uh, have finished. The central part where it was decided, and I think very cleverly, uh, uh, to, to begin with the park. Uh, to begin with the central part, so, so somehow the reception, the social reception uh, is, is being really, really nice. And even if we, have, we haven't uh, completed all, but 80% but of the, what you see here, um, <coughs> it has two sides. The side in the left of the screen has the most intense activities because it's oriented to the south. And sun is a, is a very uh, privileged uh, material in, in Shanghai. So here you see it. Uh, it has like like activities for the young, for the workers, for everyone, and, and <coughs> it's this. Uh, it's a way to move, and and it's a way to cover also this park, a huge uh, hub of transportation, the ferries of, in the river, the uh, train stations, the metro stations, and then the bus station that uh, should go where Renata is, basically, <laughs> <laughs> and. And these are the images. We wanted to create a kind of, of uh, somehow a, a little bit prehistoric. Uh, so we wanted to go back to, to the origins of the river and uh, let's say what, what made the, the mangroves, etc. what made this, this, this landscape uh, unique and uh, a settlement where, where people could, could 
live their lives and then create a city as, as incredible as Shanghai, no? with 24 million inhabitants. And this, uh, this is the <coughs> Shanghai hub of transportation. Uh, down is uh, the, uh, the access to the river ferries, and then you pass through a commercial gallery with some activities for children, uh, uh, with roof, and, and then the, the, the they are constructing this, this kind of subterranean facility here. This is why the, the way we have been working on, with this kind of <laughs> which are films. And I have several steps of workers. It's strange. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as the, the auditorium was important to have something that uh, uh, active, uh, let's say, to uh, let's say music, concerts, etc., for young people, etc. And then it has the, some panoramic views. And this, these are uh, like photovoltaic uh, um, pergolas, no? Pergolas that uh, are made of wood, a kind of, of uh, let's say, feature. Uh, we were thinking in, in, in locating these pergolas in the place where the uh, tourists want to go, because you see the river, you see the bridge, and you see the, 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 all the, let's say, uh, landscape created by the river and the center of the city with the highest uh, skyscrapers, etc. So somehow it's a kind of touristic feature <coughs> under construction in this moment, in these slides, almost built in this one being built in this. What I like is the scaffolding. Mm -hmm. That is amazing. In fact, we are making now a project that mimics this scaffolding. <coughs> well, it, it's, the, the thing of this project is that uh, they wanted all kind of things. So it was very difficult to, to uh, to, to select and to, to, let's say, give a kind of uh, uh, image to the place that could fit with all the expectations they had. We, I think that we got something like of we wanted to, to get. <coughs> These are the, the, the pergolas. And the rocks are, are by now have plants. They will have water in the at the end, and they will have a kind of big surface of water down the stairs. And this is this is all. This is the last image, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> anyone wants to make uh, any comment, positive comment, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's too hot to, 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 uh, <laughs> to discuss. No question. <laughs> okay. We finish? <laughs> okay. Uh, now there are two excursions. Uh, you have the buses waiting outside, okay? People going to the Foster Foundation, please go uh, quick because they are a little bit uh, worried about timing. Thank you very much and see you all tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Te lo saco, te doy el... Bueno, gracias por invitarme.